presentación de este coloquio CAN. Eh, y en el cierre del coloquio va a una persona que también estuvo en su apertura, eh, que es el profesor italiano Luigi Caranti, que va a presentar eh, un comentario eh, relacionado con Yes, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say something at the beginning and at the end of this, uh, this nice uh, colloquium. Um, I am going to uh, present for you this debate that is going to appear in the next uh, uh, issue of Campion Review. Um, it, as you correctly pointed out, it, it's a comment, it's a series of comments and criticism that I received of my last book, Kant's Political Legacy. Um, and uh, I thought it was uh, sensible to give you a, an idea of the book very briefly, pretty much the table of contents, so that you can better follow uh, the exchange that I have with these three scholars. Actually, I'm going to talk about San Giovanni's criticism and uh, Geyer's criticism and Rock Williams for no other reason than Williams, uh, Howard Williams' comments are too benevolent, so it's not fun to reply to them. Uh, and uh, whereas San Giovanni and Geyer poses few challenging issues that uh, it's interesting to, to discuss with you. Uh, okay, so basically the book is divided in three parts, as I was saying to some of you yesterday. Um, one is about human rights, the other one is about uh, Kant's theory of peace, and the third is about Kant's theory of progress. The first one is an attempt to exploit all the potential uh, one may find, I could find, in Kant's text uh, to offer a foundation of human rights, mainly why are human rights normatively com compelling, um, that uh, is more promising than the three foundations that are currently proposed by scholars who work on human rights. These three main orientations are called <coughs> the instrumental view, the political view, and the orthodox view or non-instrumental view. So the instrumental view about human rights is pretty much this. Uh, the normativity of human rights is explained and grounded the moment in which we simply realize that without them, our societies cannot flourish, our lives are worse than they could be in a society with <coughs> human rights that respect human rights. So ultimately, the grounding is uh, human rights are binding because we need them. If we are interested in having a good life, we need human rights. They are instrumental to having the non-instrumentalist view, or also called orthodox view, is a view that says, well, uh, rights cannot be grounded on what we need. Uh, there are many things we need that do not give rise to any right. Every single human being needs to be loved, but that doesn't mean that there is a right to be loved. Right? So uh, the inference from what we need to what we have a right to is, according to non-instrumentalists, always a very risky inference. Uh, we rather need to find an independent reason to show why uh, human beings are supposed to have certain rights just in, by virtue or of their humanity. Um, and of course, uh, my own foundation, Kant, which is inspired by Kant, obviously, falls within this uh, uh, school, um, it's an orthodox foundation with, simply because uh, we try to uh, ground the, the normativity of human rights without making reference to any interests or basic human need. Um, rather, we uh, think that uh, human interests become relevant 
moment in which you have already explained why human rights claim to have these interests that satisfied have, has to be taken seriously. So, um, the orthodoxy that is currently practiced, that is, the non-instrumentalist attempts to ground human rights, today, it seems to me, all fail to explain, uh, I mean, they all make a reference to human dignity, so the, the foundation of human rights is basically the fact that we are worthy creatures, that we have dignity, that we have a specific kind of dignity that other animals do not have, but the shortfall of this orthodox approach to human rights, in my opinion, is that no orthodox thinker makes a further step and tries to explain why we have this dignity. So what, what makes us worthy creatures? So it seems to me it's a very limited, um, it's a step in the right direction, but it's a step that doesn't go far enough because ultimately uh, everything stops with this article of faith that human beings uh, are worthy creatures or have dignity, which is obviously the way in which also the main documents about human rights present human rights, because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Treaties of the 60s, they all have in their preamble that human rights either are an expression of, or even stronger, derive from human dignity. So the orthodox view pretty much tries to, well, starts and ends with this intuition that human dignity is the foundation of human rights, but no content is given to this concept. The third view, the political view, is a fairly new approach to human, well, you know, starts with Rawls, John Rawls, so uh, uh, it's new up to a certain extent. Rawls famously introduced this idea that human rights, or better, as you could call it, human rights properly understood, the proper subset of human rights is this, uh, is this expression, are nothing but what the international community has already decided uh, are the grounds for limiting national sovereignty. So what are human rights and why are they compelling? Well, human rights are those rights that are recognized worldwide as uh, things that if they are violated, they justify the intervention in any possible form of the international community in internal affairs of states, ranging from naming and shaming that is, you know, kind of uh, general uh, disapproval of the international community for certain practice that go on within certain state up to military intervention. So for Rawls, these are human rights. Human rights are the things that justify interference within internal affairs, and the justification of human rights is pretty much the fact that they have been accepted de facto in the, in the practice of international politics. Okay, so I try to give uh, an alternative uh, foundation, which is mainly based on Kant's notion of autonomy. I try to say something, to make that further step uh, in the orthodox school by trying to explain why human beings have dignity, and I don't take myself as a revolutionary here. Uh, I uh, try to uh, explain our dignity in terms of the fact that we are the only creatures that are autonomous in the strong Kantian sense of being capable of moral behavior. I make a gesture, not much more than a gesture, in the, in the book to show why this is a more promising uh, foundation of human rights and uh, why the usual complaint against this strategy, uh, okay, fine, but now you are exploiting a, a very specific idea that was popular in the Enlightenment, actually only uh, an important part of the Enlightenment, but still a part of the Enlightenment. Uh, human rights are supposed to be ecumenical, Catholic, in the etymological sense of the word, that it's universal. Um, you cannot ground human rights on this specific philosophical 
notion that not even all philosophers agree with, and even, not even all Kant scholars think that it's well grounded. So uh, human rights need to have a quasi-universal appeal uh, if you start with this notion of uh, autonomy as capacity for moral behavior, you are parochial, as mm, we usually put this objection. The parochial objection is to make human rights something that applies only within your church, within your worldview, within your uh, under, you know, way of understanding the world. Well, I try to uh, reply to this objection. It's a huge attempt because you have to go through the major religions of the world to see that this idea of individual autonomy is not just a fixation of pietism or uh, a Protestant uh, version of Christianity and so on and so forth, but that's uh, not the center of uh, what I would like to do here today. And in fact, it's not even something that either San Giovanni or Geyer or Williams take me on um, about. So uh, that's the first part. The second part is an attempt to uh, reconstruct Kant's theory of peace and to distinguish it from the, the theory of democratic peace of which I'm sure you have heard, the fact that democracies do not fight each other, which take itself as uh, a Kantian, uh, of Kantian inspiration. So in the second part of the book, I make a, a strong distinction between Kant's original model of peace and uh, democratic peace. Uh, I say that despite what democratic peace thinks of itself, it's not that similar to the original, uh, number one. Number two, I try to show that from a purely normative point of view, Kant's model is much better and much more convincing than the model offered by democratic peace. The third and final part of the book is about Kant's theory of progress, probably the most speculative, <coughs> which means pretty much likely to be wrong, uh, part of the book uh, in which I defend Kant's progressive view of history. That is, I try to give a non-watered-down reading of uh, sections such as the guarantee for Peace, uh, or um, you know the last six, six pieces of ideas in which Kant really seems to be give, seems to me at least to be giving us some reasons purely theoretical reasons not practical reasons to believe that the system of human affairs has a tendency which I understand through the concept of, of Popper of propensity. So as an objective tendency to uh, evolve towards uh, perpetual peace or the cosmopolitan constitution, as sometimes Kant puts it. Uh, you understand why I said it's speculative, because it's, <laughs> you know, it's, a, rather, uh, it's a rather grand project, especially to put in uh, the third part of a, of a book. But uh, I mean, jokes aside, my goal there is really just to say that we should stop thinking of Kant's theory of progress merely from the practical point of view with the usual idea that all Kant is saying is that we need to assume that history is progressing toward a better future, toward perpetual peace, because otherwise we do not make sense of our moral life. That's only part of the story. I think that the interesting part of the story comes when Kant tries to tell us, to give us some reasons to believe that this is actually the case. So that in this sense, it's a theoretical attempt to do justice to Kant's uh, view of history. Okay, that's the very quick introduction to the book. Um, I go through some of the comments that uh, this distinguished scholars have made. Um, we'll see where we get. It's already quite late, but there is no need to go over them, uh, all of them. So we get there when, when we are tired and when we stop. Okay, so Andrea San Giovanni is, is, a, is an interesting case because um, it, it sounds Italian, but he's American. 
Alevovici, that uh, is, a, is a philosopher studied at Harvard when Rhodes was still there. Um, and uh, um, he's not a Kant scholar. I mean, he knows Kant, but he's not a Kant scholar of origin. And that's very interesting for me because I wrote this book uh, having in mind someone very different than people who are here, that is, Kant scholars. But you know, a more gen general public that was trying to appeal to you know people interested in politics in general, um, and uh, you know much of the style of the book, <coughs> my attempt not to be too technical, has to do with this uh, decision uh, about my audience, my desired audience. And San Giovanni is, is a good example of what I was fishing for. Um, so. Uh, in fact, his comments are not very much internal to Kant, which is exactly what I what I was expecting. Okay, so let me read a little bit. Andrea San Giovanni's comments uh, all focus on the first part of, of Kant's political legacy. Uh, after uh, uh, resume uh, of my book, he moves four major criticism, three of which relate to my idea that autonomy is something that should that we should look at if we want to explain why we owe things to humans simply by virtue of their being human, which is <coughs> the main idea behind human rights. Following Kant, following Kant, as I was saying, I argue that we are autonomous creatures and that our autonomy bestows on us, gives us an inherent worth and as a consequence dignity. The reason is that autonomy makes us capable of agency fully unrelated to our sensuous inclinations to obey a principle we perceive as morally mandatory. Kant says that autonomy places us above the natural world. Less emphatically, we could say that autonomy makes us creatures that systematically escape the description of themselves that make them merely intelligent pursuers of their own well-being and preoccupied only with the satisfaction of their desires. But here is San Giovanni's first problem. If autonomy is an inherent worth that confers on us this status, this dignitary status, there appears to be a gap between my having that value am I having rights? So, first criticism he has, okay, let's take seriously this idea that we have this inherent value, but there is still a gap between having this inherent value because we are autonomous and having rights. Why does he think so? Well, ironically, this gap would be similar to the one that I myself spotted in another account by James Griffin, um, who moves, in my opinion, uh, without justification from caring about agency to having a right to the conditions that make agency possible. So in, you, you see in Griffin you have an, uh, uh, an example of instrumentalism. Basically, he says, everybody cares about being an agent. Everybody has an interest to remain an agent. Therefore, everybody is committed to uh, recognize the importance of the conditions that allow us to remain agents. And since human rights defend these conditions to remain agents, therefore, human rights are grounded. So I criticize this kind of uh, argument because uh, I think that uh, you cannot move from caring about agency to having a right to the conditions that make agency possible. Pretty much in the same way in which you cannot move from your caring about being loved to uh, a right to uh, being loved. Okay, so, uh, but um, San Giovanni thinks that a gap similar to the one I was criticizing against Griffin can be also uh, detected in my account. This time the gap is supposed to be generated by the non-relational structure of inherent worth, a value that exists independently of whether someone can claim it 
and addresses of that claim can be identified. And the clearly, so on the one hand, we have this inherent value with a non-relational structure, so this kind of, you know, my idea that humans have this inherent worth linked to their capacity for moral behavior. And on the other hand, rights that have a clearly rela relational nature and structure. Um, and for, for San Giovanni, this makes my foundation already suspicious. Because if it has supposed to be a, a, a foundation of rights, and I start from something that has a nature that is completely different from the things I want to ground, then uh, there is something that is not working. So to explain his point, San Giovanni gives the example of a great, extremely beautiful, hence valuable painting, which as such has intrinsic worth. In this sense, he thinks great paintings can be said to have dignity. Uh, they bestow on us duties, that's beyond questions. We are, for example, to preserve them and pass them to future generations. But it would be bizarre, San Giovanni continues, to say that they have corresponding rights against us, because they cannot in their own name make claims on us. And in the same way, even if autonomy were the high value I, cl I claim it to be, it, autonomy would still be unable to generate rights against specific addressees. Autonomy, for example, may be able to protect people generically against torture, but is unable to protect me against you torturing me. So, I don't know if the point is, is clear. He's saying, Look, imagine a great painting. We can say that this great painting has an inherent worth. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we can also concede the fact that this great painting produces duties towards that painting that we have. So we have to preserve the Joconda for future generations. It's a duty that we have. But that's still not sufficient because it would be bizarre to say that the painting, because of its inherent value, uh, can make a claim on us. The way in which, uh, in, uh, to the contrary, uh, usually humans are thought to be making claims towards other humans to have certain rights respected. So no relational structure and relational structure that collide. Okay, so if this is what San Giovanni has in mind, the first criticism has to do with this relational, no relational structure, this is the way I would address his uh, criticism. Well, to begin with, even granting that paintings have dignity an expression not accidentally rather strange, this dignity is quite different from the one Kant attributes to humans. As San Giovanni knows, the value of the painting is that of a commodity. In fact, it has a price on the market, like anything that is valuable to us, uh, because it satisfies some desire or serves some interest. Uh, so to say that the painting has a value is pretty much to say that it has a value on the market. And it has a value on the market because its beauty uh, you know, appeals to us. So it's the value of a commodity, basically, of a good. Um, and the painting would be worth nothing if we did not take aesthetic pleasure from seeing it. Now let's recall the passage from the Metaphysics of Morals in which Kant basically says that anything has a price in the world except persons, except people. Because people display autonomy. It seems that the dignity of a great painting does not fall in the same category of that of people. This should already caution against the impression that what I mean by autonomy can be somehow likened uh, to what 
we all mean by the value of a great painting or any other commodity. Quite simply, a great painting has a commodity-like value, not a dignity. In fact, people usually do not say that paintings, even the best one, have dignity. They say that they have value. Okay, so maybe that's just a terminological point, though. Um, The second piece of the answer that I have to this first comment is that even granting that the value of a painting is sufficiently similar to the value of human dignity as Khan and I construed it, I confess that I fail to see the relational problem San Giovanni indicates. So now I'm biting the bullet, as we say. Uh, is it really the case that dignity focusing of dignity does not allow me to do justice to the relational structures that rights have. I don't think so. Um, my dignity gives me a claim against everybody to be treated with respect. And in general, the dignity possessed by all human beings give all of them a right against everybody to be treated Respect. So, why is it not possible to reach these relational structures that is inherent within rights and therefore also in human rights, starting from dignity? It seems to me that there is a fairly clear relational structure there, I and mean, at least that's what Kant has in mind, in my opinion. When he says, each human being has dignity, it basically means that he can make a claim against everybody to be treated with respect. Now, what to be treated with respect means can be discussed, but that's a different issue. Now, we are trying just to see whether we can get to this rela relational structure, starting from this uh, thesis that we have dignity. I can make this argument against everybody, and of course everyone else can make this claim against uh, all other persons. So it seems to me that uh, it's pretty much all we have uh, to have the relational structures that we need. And to go back to the example of torture, I mean, how would an account that starts from dignity deal with the problem of you torturing me? Well. It just takes the application of a general principle to the singular case to, to understand that I or you should not torture me because I have dignity and you fall in the set of addressees that are under the obligation to treat me with respect. So um, maybe I don't understand this first criticism very well because it seems to me quite easy to respond. Uh, so sometimes I believe I, I didn't get exactly what uh, San Giovanni uh, had in mind. Okay, let's move to the second criticism, which is much more straightforward. San Giovanni's second criticism uh, is that I'm focusing on autonomy, okay, and specifically this means to focus on a capacities to be good, not on being good. So. Uh, I'm saying that humans have to be treated with respect merely because they are capable of moral behavior, not because and when they are moral, which is obviously something very different. Now, San Giovanni says quite naturally, why should we respect people? simply because they have the capacity to be good. Why should give this capacity confer any value on them? There could be humans who have this capacity and never use it to uh, make moral decisions. Well, to begin with, um, let me clarify that um, I would like to react to the way in which San Giovanni frames this critique. He 
because to reinforce his point, he says, I'm quoting, after all, all human beings, uh, after all, sorry, human beings can use their capacity to act morally or to act immorally. Okay, then what's wrong with this way of phrasing the criticism? Well, what's wrong with this way of phrasing the criticism is that by autonomy in the book, and I explained that at some length, I don't mean, as <laughs> I think any good Kant scholar should mean, uh, a generic notion of freedom, basically the ability to do whatever you want, moral actions or immoral actions. When you talk about autonomy, as we all know, in, in a Kantian context, you talk about capacity for moral behavior. It's a distinct form of freedom which is the real seat of our uh, world, according to, to Kant. It's not practical freedom, which he also discusses, but that at least in the, from the first critique on, uh, as such is no longer sufficient for the sake of morality. Um, anyway, so uh, that's just a reaction to the way in which he frames the criticism. Uh, but uh, more to the to the meat of um, his point. Uh, if I can find it, sorry. So I don't take myself as begging the question here. I mean, 
if you allow, if you concede me that we have this special capacity for moral behavior, it seems to me that this is not irrelevant for the sake of the foundation of human rights. Just because I'm focusing on a capacity, it does not mean that I am uh, not making a significant step in the directions we want to make, which is to explain why creatures like ourselves deserve uh, a certain kind, a, a certain kind of treatment, merely by virtue of the kind of creatures that we are. Um, now, of course, you can react to the argument by saying uh, that this asks to um, accept Kant's idea of a linkage between a capacity, capacity for moral behavior, and dignity. Uh, is this an article of faith? Well, that's the third part of my answer to this objection against the capacity focus. Okay, so basically now the objection becomes, okay, fine, if we had these beautiful capacities for moral behavior, then we would be worthy of the protection that human rights uh, promise. But it's a big if. How do we know that we are capable of moral behavior? Which is another way of saying, how do we know that we are autonomous? Okay, now, clearly, in a Kantian, from a Kantian perspective, empirical confirmation of our autonomy is not to be sought. Um, and in the book, uh, I refer to what I take to be Kant's strongest argument for you know, what is sometimes called the reality of freedom, which is the main subject of the second critique, obviously. And the, the best argument he has for this uh, grand thesis is the fact of reason, uh, which it's in turn I take as the immediate consciousness that each of us has of the fact that we can to, in pretty much all circumstances, what morality requires. So, you know, I don't have to remind you of the famous example in the second critique when Cam talks about this poor guy threatened by the powerful man to give false testimony against an innocent man. You know? So, Cam tells us, you know, let's try to be in the shoes of this poor guy who is threatened. We don't know whether we would resist the threat and be the hero and say, no, fuck you, dictator. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, uh, give in this poor innocent man simply because you are threatening me. Um, so nobody knows whether we would be so courageous to resist the threat, but we know that we could, right? So. That's, the, in my opinion, one way, to, a good way to understand uh, what it means to have the fact of reason. Uh, it's the immediate consciousness that pretty much in all circumstances we could do what morality requires. Um, so, this is a kind of thought experiment that each of us can do and short of empirical confirmation, it's pretty much the best um, uh, thesis, the best hint we can get to uh, be convinced that we are autonomous. So, um, that's my threefold answer to uh, uh, San Giovanni um, general concern that starting from a capacity will not get what we need. His next worry, and uh, perhaps I'm going to stop about San Giovanni with this uh, uh, criticism, is that we may be autonomous. Okay, now he concedes to me that we are autonomous, but he says, wait, we may be autonomous, not all in the same degrees. 
So it could be that this capacity is, is distributed among individual human beings in a different way. So that I am more autonomous than you or less autonomous than you. Why would we believe, as he puts it, that individuals' capacity to act in accordance with the moral law are equal? Some individuals' capacity to act morally are very high, on average, and in normal conditions they display great moral strength, resoluteness, resilience, and courage, whereas others' capacities are very low. So if dignity, as I claim, resides in this capacity to act morally, then why should not those with greater moral capacities have greater dignity and therefore higher status? Now, if that were the case, the, my foundation would be a disaster, obviously, because I would be uh, assigning human rights depending on the degree of the autonomy that each of us has. But of course, there is what Alan Buchanan calls the egalitarianism of human rights, which means that any conception, any credible conception of human rights has to uh, be faithful to the intuition that um, human beings are equal, uh, at least for what concerns the respect that human rights promises for them. Okay, so not only this, but San Giovanni also adds uh, another point because he warns me against a possible easy way out from this criticism. Because if I say that the difference individual displaying moral behavior is insufficient ground to deny that we all have the same capacity, but simply that we exercise it more or less often or more or less well, then he says, we seem to have departed very far from a common sense view of what a capacity is and to have won the argument at the price of a highly controversial metaphysical view. So if I say, well, wait a minute, I know that people vary greatly in uh, performance, in moral performances, but this could simply mean that they exercise more or less well the same capacity that they have in the same degree uh, and that does not come in degree. So it's just a question of behavioral uh, actualization of the same capacity, but the capacity is the same. Okay, if I do that according to San Giovanni, I have too far from what we usually understand by capacity. Okay, so how do I reply? Well, to begin with, it's important to realize that autonomy or capacity for moral behavior on my reading and I think also on Kant's understanding is simply the capacity to overcome all sensuous impulses if that is necessary to act morally. So I don't want habits, second natures, Aristotelian second natures developed through exercise to be part of autonomy. So I'm not saying that you are autonomous only if you are a virtuous person, to put it very you know, crudely. You are autonomous even if you have not exercised your moral character, if you have not refined your inclinations, you have not worked enough on your passions, and so on and so forth. That's, it's simply not what I mean by being autonomous. For being entitled to the status that confers human rights, on my theory, you simply need to pass a minimal threshold. What is the threshold? The threshold is precisely the ability to overcome any impulse if that is necessary uh, for acting uh, according, well, from the, from the, not according. Um, Now, the question begins, is, is this self-evidently false, as a matter of fact, that all human beings have these minimal capacities? Because that seems what San Giovanni has in mind. It seems to say, you know, if you, if you look at the difference in moral performance uh, among human beings, 
there is really no reason to believe that this supervenes on the existence of a minimal moral capacities that they all share. Uh, no, I don't think it's self-evidently false that we have this minimal capacity. Um, and again, I refer back to the way in which we take ourselves in our immediate consciousness, the moment in which we think um, ourselves in situations similar to the one of the innocent man, I mean, of the, of the man threatened to give false testimony against uh, an innocent so I think it's part and parcel of our self-understanding to know that we are autonomous and to know it because we know that in all circumstances we could. Now, to know that we could is not to be certain that we would uh, act in all circumstances according to the moral law, but that's not what we need to prove because I'm focusing on having a capacity to and I think that having this capacity is pretty much part of the way in which we understand ourselves. So I don't take my position and Kant's position to be far from common sense at all. Uh, and I, I give an example to try to show independently of, you know, let's, walk, let's put ourselves in the shoes of someone who is threatened. Uh, to show why this uh, being autonomous is part of the way in which we usually think of ourselves. So let me give you this thought experiment. Let's imagine that we have to judge a woman who has stolen property but claims to be affected by kleptomania. So she claims, uh, I'm sick, I know it, it's wrong, but you know, I have this compulsion it's a, it's a condition that I have. There is nothing I can do about it. Now, before this scenario, it seems that we have only two options. Either we believe the story that she's telling, we consider therefore her insane and therefore not responsible for the crime, or we don't believe the story. Independently and independently of all the possible mitigating circumstances, she stole it because she was un hungry, she stole it for their kids and so on and so forth, we find her guilty. So we do not say that her, her autonomy and therefore her accountability, her responsibility was depleted, so was diminished. We don't punish her because she did not develop past moral fortitude. So we either say that she was autonomous and therefore she is responsible and therefore we punish her, or we say that she was not autonomous because she was insane. We don't have a scalar conception of autonomy. Either she was autonomous or she was not. Either she was responsible or she was not responsible. Um, if we decide that she's guilty, we do not make the gravity of punishment dependent on how autonomous she was, but uh, on how pressing were the sensible motives that suggested that kind of behavior. So let's imagine we don't believe the story, therefore we say, no, no, wait a minute, you were not sick at all. You are, it's not true that you are affected by kleptomania. We understand that you might have done it for very pressing uh, need. Uh, you were hungry, your kids were hungry, and so on and so forth. And this, of course, gives us all the latitude to be soft as possible in punishing her. But we should not conflate these mitigating circumstances uh, as a judgment that her autonomy was diminished. Autonomy doesn't come in degrees. Either you are or you are not. Uh, what comes in degrees is the level of punishment that I'm going to give you according to the objective circumstances in which you were. Because it's one way to steal with no need for stealing, or just for the pleasure of it, or just you know, 
because you need some luxury items and it's a different thing to steal if you do it to remain uh, alive, obviously. Um, so, there is a final twist uh, about this uh, criticism that uh, San Giovanni is uh, raising. And this has to do with a specific way in which I conceive autonomy, and here I depart significantly from Kant, because I want to say that we are, strictly speaking, not the only species that has capacity for moral behaviors, but only the species that has this capacity most developed in the animal because I want to say there is something like animal uh, autonomy. So, and for Kant, as you know, for Kant to talk about a capacity for moral behavior in the case of animals would be like cursing, uh, but I think that, you know, after 250 years of evolutionary theory, we have to be a little bit more careful in attributing to ourselves uh, something that you know, is completely removed from the rest of the animal world. So I think it's safer to say, and also closer to the evidence at our disposal, uh, to say that we are autonomous in the highest degree in the animal world, uh, whereas other animal species, apes, primates, higher mammals, and so on, um, have a lesser degree of autonomy that is a lesser capacity for moral behavior. There is abundant ideological evidence that shows that rats, uh, chimpanzee, um, monkeys obviously are uh, capable of pro-social attitudes of uh, taking upon themselves pain for the sake of uh, other individuals uh, of the society they, they belong to and so on and so forth. So, um, of course, they don't act from duty, uh, uh, and uh, we should not exaggerate in, with this idea of animal morality or animal capacity for moral behavior, but at the same time, we need to make some room for the possibility that the difference between our morality and animal morality is not a difference in kind, but it's a little bit of difference in degree. Now, of course, San Giovanni jumps on this refinement that I have to say, wait a minute, you just explained to us that autonomy does not come in degree, but you tell us that the difference between our species and other species is exactly a difference in degree. So how can you hold these two things together? Uh, okay, so... I think that there is a way of making my minimal conception of human autonomy compatible with my thesis of animal autonomy. In the book, I attributed a certain degree of moral agency to, no, to non-human primates. However, I never suggested that they reach the ability to silence all their natural impulses, that is, that they reach the minimal threshold of autonomy. But, you know, only as a way of seeing, I talk about animal autonomy, because what I mean is really that they are capable of moral uh, uh, behavior, uh, whatever you understood by that, which basically means pro-social attitude. So the exact way of putting the point would be to say that animals approximate without reaching the capacity of pure agents. And in fact, in the book, I attributed to them the capacity of self-sacrifice. How could one deny that dogs, for example, have this capacity for sacrifice, even for their master? But this is different. Animals seem to sacrifice themselves because the, 
hepatic inputs to save their master or their offspring can be stronger than the instinct of survival. In contrast, humans are supposed to make, or to be able to make, a conscious and detached deliberation about their course of action. In animal morality, it is just this conscious, free, reflexive endorsement of such an act that seems to be missing. Um, okay, that's pretty much my answer. Um, uh, I, I concede to San Giovanni that in talking about animal autonomy, I invited this misunderstanding of saying that really uh, I am attributing to um, animals the capacity to act from duty, which is something that I never said, even in the book. What I meant to be saying is that uh, animals have a capacity to detach themselves from their own selfish um, uh, interests and to act for the sake of other individuals in, in their group, which you know is similar enough in structure to the structure of morality the way we understand it. But of course, uh, this is very different from uh, saying that animals have reached uh, that minimal threshold that makes other beings uh, autonomous, that is, that makes us autonomous. So, um, my answer here is to say, uh, no, I hold on to the fact that autonomy does not come in degrees, either you are or you are not. And when I opened up for animal autonomy, that was just a way of saying, basically, but what I meant is that the realm of morality cannot coincide with the, with the realm of human beings. Um, okay, uh, so the fourth and last criticism of San Giovanni I'm not going to discuss because this has to do with his idea, I'm just mentioning what the point is. Um, this has to do with a paper that he published in, um, in a collection on human rights by Oxford University Press in 2015 called uh, uh, Can There Be a Truly Kantian Theory of Human Rights? And of course, San Giovanni answers no. Why? Well, because <coughs> he thinks that um, For Kant, uh, the idea of, but I put it very crudely, for Kant, the idea of having an external authority that interfere within the national affairs of a state is basically impossible because this would be like an unilateral uh, imposition uh, that uh, cannot be justified from a Kantian point of view. Since human rights, though, are mainly, essentially at least, uh, opening up for the possibility of intervention within national affairs, then uh, this makes the Kant's theory of right on one end and the way in which human rights are usually understood incompatible with one another. Um, I, I am not convinced by this argument, but um, I don't want to Oh my god, it's already seven. <laughs> well, I took all my time, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, I'm not saying anything about that. I'm not saying anything about the Paul Geyer's criticism. I stopped, uh, I apologize, I was looking at the wrong arrow in my watch. <laughs> 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 it, it was 40, <laughs> so 740. Okay, so I'll stop here.
period. My theory is to say, well, no, there is a relation between these two things. We want to keep them distinguished, of course, but there must be a relation between these two things. And uh, a good theory of human rights is a theory that is capable of explaining most of the international human rights that we have through uh, a theory of what moral human rights are. Uh, and that does not make a list of moral human rights that is too different from the list of international human rights that we have. It's called the fidelity condition. Joshua Cohen calls it the fidelity condition. But I, I don't want to say that they are identical. <laughs> to your second point, uh, when I want to, when I say that we should ground human rights autonomy, I'm not committing myself to the thesis that only first generation of human rights are important. So only civic and political rights matter, social and economic, you know, if possible. But you know, if, if resources are available, otherwise it doesn't matter. No, I'm not saying that. And of course that's a problem for my account because you know, starting from such abstract notion of autonomy, okay, yeah, Let's assume that we are autonomous, that, let's assume that this gives us a privileged position in the world, but how do you move from this abstract notion to the concrete things that human rights protect? So shelter, education, basic medication, uh, schooling, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, uh, I, my answer there is that this is the space for this is where politics should come in and say, okay, we know, because these great philosophers, Kant, not Kant, the obvious, told us that we are uh, dignitary entities, we have dignities, we, can, we have to be respected. Our job is to translate this respect that philosophy has already grounded into specific political measures that render this idea of respect, that make this idea of respect concrete. So of course, there is latitude in here, um, uh, but there are also things that you cannot do. I mean, you cannot treat people as children if you have taken seriously the fact that you are autonomous, which already tells you a lot about the kind of civic and political rights that you have to give. You cannot let start people because you have at least to give the opportunity to uh, uh, continue to be autonomous uh, beings and so on and so forth. So again, there is space for political discussion, political compromise, debate, disagreement, uh, negotiation ab about how you translate respect into specific international human rights or political decisions. But I would be already quite satisfied if we started from this main normative premise that is purely the business of philosophy to establish. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that um, difference between um, the, the total autonomy and the lower degree autonomy of animals, because uh, Kant is talking about that also when he says that, well, there's one thing that's also an outcome of the good, that's the good heart, acting out of the good heart, acting because of, of empathy or pity, but that's not coming out of some kind of, of conscious principles I can give myself. That's the difference, but it can be both uh, in some kind of good deed. And he says, well, women only have the ability to act out of a good heart and out, out of some, some kind of, of effect. And um, I think that's the difference you wanted to do with the, with the animals. And my question is then, if there was the need of another lower degree rights for that kind of animals. Yeah. Because for Kant, animals shouldn't be hurt or be, be treated cruelly just because of it's bad for my own morals, but not for the dog. It's, it's for the dog, it's very um, indifferent if, I, if, I, if I'm cruel to him, but just for, my, from, for the relationship for me to myself or to other people, actually. So, so I, 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 don't, I, don't, I cannot be <coughs> cruel to animals, not out of respect of them, but out of respect Because for it's me. bad for my morals, yeah, okay. that's what, what Kant is saying. Yeah. For, so are there some kind of lower degree rights for animals, if you, if you put that in charge? 
yes, I, I think that we should not we should not treat cows or dogs the same way in which we are allowed to eat, uh, treat insects, uh, because they are closer to this ideal of capacity for moral behavior that we only uh, um, embody. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the distinction I was trying to make. I, I would not say that animals are autonomous in the sense that they, you know, step outside of their impulses and deliberate, okay, what should I do with this dictator who's threatening me? Should I give in? Should I you know, think about my life, my family, and so on and so forth. This process of moral deliberation, quite detached, quite rational. And that's not what animals do, pretty much, we are certain. I mean, again, even there, there is, I mean, if you look a little bit at the literature, it's interesting to see that sometimes animals are caught in what seems to be moral dilemma. When, where, but, I mean, you know, imagine a, a dog, you know, you, you give a command to a dog, and he knows that, he, or he, a cat you cannot command, but a dog you, you, you can give an order to a dog, and he knows that he's not supposed to do that, but sometimes he's very tempted to do that. And therefore, you know, if you look at him, you see that he really doesn't know what he or she should do. That's a kind of, of course, it's easier to categorize, to conceptualize that kind of dilemma as a sort of pushing of two forces, two emotional forces that compete with one another and then uh, decide for the kind of behavior as opposed to, okay, yes, I have these uh, impulses, but now I step back and I evaluate from a distant point of view. But in my theory, to, to answer your question, there is a space for attributing some rights to higher animals, precisely because they are in this hierarchy uh, lower than, than humans, but higher than, than other kind of animals. So it's really, I mean, it's a, it's a grand ontological view of, of the animal world, but in a sense it's what we already do, because of course we do not treat dogs or we should at least we think that dogs should not be treated the way in which uh, insects or lower animals can be treated. And this has to do, of course, with their capacity of suffering, but also with their capacity of getting closer to a behavior that is not merely selfish or a response to, to an instinct, but takes into account moral, broadly understood moral considerations. interesante y creo que tocó temas que seguramente nos conmovieron a todos, pero lamentablemente tenemos que abandonar la sala, así que te agradezco mucho a Francisco Escalante y vamos a aplaudir su presentación. Muchas gracias a todos.